Welcome back everyone, it's Michael with Offshore Citizen and we are going to talk today about a subject called trust. So I tried to do a video on this when I was in Budapest, but uh, it started raining and there was a lot of people around and a lot of noise and things like this and so it caused some issues. So we're going to talk today about what are trusts, how do trusts work, what are the benefits of trust, we'll give you a little bit of an overview and then we'll dive in some other videos into specific things about trust. So to start off with, what is a trust? Okay. Now, a trust is commonly confused with being like a corporation. So when I talk to clients, they'll say, oh, so the trust owns this. No, trusts are not like corporations. They're not legal entities per se. They are uh, instruments. They are uh, like relationships between various parties, okay? So if we think historically about where trusts came from, they go back to the time of the Crusades actually, when what would happen was somebody was going away on a crusade, you don't know when they're going to come back, if they will come back, they could be gone for you know years and they may die, and they would give their assets to the church to take care of and then you know do whatever with upon their return or when they die. Okay, that was the original concept of trust. Trust then later came into uh, British common law and are basically a common law instrument. And so we'll talk a little bit later about how uh, even though they're a common law instrument, they can apply in civil law jurisdictions and how that all works. Anyway, so a trust is a relationship fundamentally between three parties. Now you can get other parties involved there. It's very common to have two others that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but it consists of a settler in the US. It's called a grantor, okay? So a settler is the person who creates the trust, all right? The person who takes the assets and puts them into trust, right? And they do this by transferring to a trustee, okay? So the trustee is the person who holds the assets. So the easiest, most common example that you can see of this, although there's similar types of relationships around there, is uh, an executor of a will. So somebody dies, the executor now, it's not the executor's uh, assets, but the executor takes all those assets and distributes them to the beneficiaries, okay? Same thing here, right? That's why we'll hear last will and testament, right? And it's uh, this thing. So, okay. Uh, so you've got the settler transfers to the trustee. The trustee is going to hold for the beneficiaries. Okay, so these are the three parties. So we sometimes depict it with a triangle to show you, you know, there's three parties. And this is governed by what's called a trust deed. Okay, so a trust deed is the document, and we'll, we'll go into that in a minute, uh, the document which describes how it is that those assets are to be managed. So unlike if I say just give assets to someone, right, so maybe... I don't know, I give assets to someone and say, hey, take care of my family or something, or take care of this. Well, that person isn't governed by what to do with it, right? In the case of a trust deed, the trust deed is telling them that the trustee has to very specifically follow a set of rules on what is to be done, okay? And very often this is a registered trust company. It might be a service provided by various banks. It might be, you know, other different financial institutions. And, Again, you can kind of think about this similar to what happens when you give your money to say a money manager, right? The money doesn't belong to the money manager. You're giving the money to the money manager who is going to do something with it very specifically and they're gonna to have to follow a set of uh, laws, right, around managing somebody else's money. And the ultimate idea is they're gonna give it back to you. Now in that example, there isn't beneficiaries who are involved, but you, know, you still have this similar trust relationship, okay? And in fact, uh, a trust does not necessarily need to be formal, okay? So, for example, uh, there's a very famous case in the U.S. It created something called Quist Closed Trusts, okay? You can look that up. It's Q-U-I-S-T-C-L-O-S-E. Uh, Quist Closed Trusts. And this was a case where a company paid some money to another company to do something with that money on their behalf, okay? So, the money wasn't given as like, hey, I'm paying an invoice. It was, hey, I'm giving this money to you and you need to make a purchase or an investment or something. So before they completed that transaction, the company that the money was given to went bankrupt, all right? And the argument was, hey, this money that was given to them is not assets of the company that went bankrupt and there should, or should not be considered as part of the assets to be distributed in the event of bankruptcy. This is a trust relationship and it resulted in the creation of what they call quist closed trusts, okay? And so the money was then given back separate from the creditors, okay? It wasn't treated, it wasn't available to the creditors. Then you have something similar when a bank goes bankrupt, right? The money of the depositors will be considered to be the money of the depositors regardless 
It's not assets that can be divided up by the creditors. Okay, it's not like, hey, I deposited my money in, for example, Caledonian Bank in Cayman Islands, which went down a number of years ago. Uh, I put my money on deposit there, there's problems, they're gonna go bankrupt, their creditors are coming. Well, it's not like you have to worry that the creditors are gonna take that money. The creditors have, are not entitled to that money that's on deposit with the bank, okay? So it goes back, perfect. Now, doesn't mean that that can't be abused. For example, in the case of a lot of these cryptocurrency exchanges, you know, they've gone down, they've basically stolen people's money. It's horrible, right? But, you know, uh, at least from a creditor standpoint, there's protection, okay? So that's how you can have these uh, kind of formal things. Now, let's recognize that the way that trusts get treated in different places varies, okay? Uh, so in some places, they treat trusts much like a corporation. And where this is relevant, I guess, particularly is with taxes. Does the trust have a tax identity and pay taxes itself? Or is there flow through to uh, the beneficiaries? Or is it taxed at the level of the trustee, right? These could be separate uh, considerations issued, right? And different countries will handle this in different ways. So now a bunch of countries don't have trust legislation, okay? And so this is a common misconception, I guess I would say, that I encounter, including with lawyers in various different parts of the world, where they'll say, well, there's no trusts here. It's like, yeah, but that doesn't mean that a trust can't operate there, okay? So anytime you have a trust, you have what we call three different jurisdictions, okay? This is something that we get into that's fairly complex. Most people don't really get into it, but. Uh, you have the jurisdiction of registration, where is the trust registered, okay? And sometimes trusts don't need to be registered, right? So in a bunch of parts of the world, it's more common now that offshore jurisdictions require registration. Historically, say, Belize didn't need the trust to be registered, essentially. Now they do, that's an updated rule. Uh, if you're in, say, Nevada, trust doesn't need to be registered, okay? So that's something else. Uh, which, by the way, gives you a higher level of privacy, right? There isn't a central register that somebody can go look at to say, hey, does this trust exist? Okay, so assets transferred into trust, perfect, all is well and good. And, uh, you know, what's next? We say, okay, perfect. Well, we now need to look and say, let's get, uh, let's kind of see uh, where is that going to be, what we call adjudicated. Okay, so this is the rules. Whose laws is this going to be subject to, right? We have a place of registration, we have the place of adjudication. These can be separate, okay? It doesn't necessarily mean that you're dealing with the here versus there. Now, you can write something in the trust uh, deed, and that doesn't necessarily mean that in point of fact, that will be the case. And this is a common misconception, kind of the conspiracy theorist, the, and that's not conspiracy theorist, but the people who don't really know what they're talking about with respect to asset protection will often say, oh yeah, you know, you have this Nev Nevis Trust or this Cook Islands Trust, and you know, you're just gonna put it in there, and if there's any problems, they have to go sue in Nevis or Cook Islands, and it's super creditor, uh, it's anti-creditor, right? It's not a creditor friend or lead jurisdiction, and so as a result, you're not gonna be able to get through. Well, in practice, if the asset is, you know, let's say in Sydney, Australia, the court in Sydney may say, oh, we're just gonna disregard Cook Islands law, and we're gonna operate accordingly. So that's something that you have to consider, and we'll talk more about that in the asset protection videos that we put out. Okay, third jurisdiction is the jurisdiction of administration. This is where the trustee is, okay? Where are you administering this from? And this is where you can have a trust in a jurisdiction where there's no trusts, right? Of course, let's say I'm in Bulgaria today. So in Bulgaria, there's no trust laws, okay? It's not a thing. It's typically not in civil law jurisdictions, although there's some exceptions. Uh, there's something called the Hague Convention on the recognition of trusts and their applicability which was set up, which allows a bunch of these other countries to recognize the trust laws of foreign countries when they operate there, which is very interesting, right? Uh, but it doesn't mean that a trustee couldn't operate in that jurisdiction and administer a, let's say, UK trust or you know some other type of trust from Bulgaria, right? So that's something, something to be aware of. Okay, so that's our three jurisdictions. What do we come to next? Uh, so there's two additional roles that can sometimes pl be played. They are the protector and they are an investment manager. And you could, in theory, come up with a bunch of others, right? Various different types of advisors. But these are the two most common. As you might say, hey, we have a protector, we have an investment manager. How does this end up working in practice? Well, in theory, like a trust document can be written up 
pretty much however you want. Like, it is enormously flexible, especially if you go, for example, Cayman Islands has something called Star Trust. Uh, it's a special trust administrative regime. That's what STAR stands for. Uh, and you can basically, anything you put in a contract, you can put into a trust. And the advantage of that is it's protected by trust law. Now, in spite of this, STAR trusts are not necessarily that useful uh, for people who are doing things outside of Cayman Islands because fundamentally the Cayman Islands laws are not necessarily that useful for what you're doing and that's not necessarily an amazing administrative region for certain stuff. If you're a hedge fund or something, maybe. But if you're talking about, say, asset protection, it's not where you want to be, okay? So, okay, uh, there's lots of different rules and you can write this out. Now, why do I mention this? I see a bunch of people who will sell kind of boilerplate trusts online. It's like $2,000 to get your Nevis trust. Nonsense, garbage, don't touch it. It's horrible. A trust is a very precise instrument that should be written very well to make sure that it's going to hold up and adhere to the rules that you're trying to make it adhere to in the jurisdiction where you're operating, okay? That's very, very important. So to give you some idea, uh, we were doing some trusts for some clients recently, they're like 83 pages, okay? That's a long trust. Uh, we did some other one, it was, I don't know, somewhere around like 40, 45 pages. So that's, you know, you might say, oh, this is so long, why is it? Well, it's like, because it has, a, it has to consider a lot of different things, right? So let's talk about, two of the most common uh, variables in trusts that you're gonna have. And you know, we kind of simplify to these, but the truth is there's lots of little nuances. Like you could write, it's, what, are, what are trusts most commonly used for? They're most commonly used for inheritance, right? Okay, I'm going to pass my assets on to my kids, my grandkids, etc. And maybe it's gonna be somebody who, you know, you don't necessarily, uh, like you don't wanna just give them the money Maybe you have a disabled child and you want to make sure the child is taken care of. Maybe you want to make sure that your kids and grandkids and great grandkids receive an education, right? So you're saying, well, I don't want that money to be eroded and then not be able to have their schooling paid for. Or you want to take care of their medical bills or something like that, right? And there's often rules within the law specifically to deal with things like medical bills. Okay, so, okay, great, perfect. Well, uh, in a case like that, you may have what's called a revocable trust. So there's two ways to go. There's revocable and there's irrevocable. Pretty simple, right? Revocable means I'm putting the assets into trust as the settler, and I can close the trust down and take the assets back, right? This has tax consequences because usually, if you have a revocable trust, the taxability of the trust is gonna be based on where the uh, settler is, okay? They're basically gonna be considered to be the settler's assets until the settler passes away. It's not always the case, right? But it can it's often the case that they look at it this way. And it makes logical sense, right? Because you just think, well, whose assets are those, okay? The next example is you could be in a situation where uh, you have irrevocable. This is where I put the assets in and I don't have access to them. Now, they still might be taxable based on the settler. They might be taxable based on the trustee. They might be taxable based on the beneficiaries. It depends on the rules of the particular country you're dealing with. Uh, you have cases such as in Canada, where often trust administration and management, et cetera, they use management and control rules that they use for companies in trust. So, you know, the trustee is gonna make it Canadian, if it's Canadian trustee, it's Canadian taxable. But you can, by contrast, look at Israel, where uh, you can have trust management and the trustee does not make it taxable. So, you know, these are different, different sets of rules, okay? So the point is, these serve different purposes. Very often, if you're talking about four, uh, for inheritance purposes, for kind of legacy, passing on wealth to the next generation purposes, revocable trusts are very common. And you'll often see family trusts designed it this way. By the way, there's lots of fancy language. They'll say, oh, you know, this is a, I don't know, whatever family trust, this is a, you know, they'll come up with all sorts of fancy names. Uh, there's something called a Henson Trust in, uh, in Canada, etc. These things are mostly nonsense, okay? Like it's marketing speak. The truth is you have a trust that's written up in a certain way that has certain characteristics. And that set of characteristics is sometimes described as this type of trust in this jurisdiction. But fundamentally, it's, it's not like there's a separate legal vehicle, okay? Uh, although you may have such a, uh, something called a spendthrift trust, which kind of brings us to our revocable or irrevocable side, which is for asset protection, right? You say, okay, for asset protection purposes, I'm trying to protect my assets, so I have to put them in there irrevocably. Why is this important? It's because if I'm in a situation where somebody can come and they sue me, 
And okay, the assets are in trust, they're protected, right? It's like, well, no, you're allowed to close that trust. So you owe me money, we're gonna, the court's gonna force you to shut down that trust, take the assets back and pay the creditor. Whereas if it's an irrevocable trust, you're like, I can't, it's not my assets anymore. I've passed them off. Okay, so that's kind of the next piece. So revocable versus irrevocable. And the next one, which can vary quite a bit, is discretionary versus uh, non-discretionary. Okay, so it's more really the question of how much discretion do you have? In other words, let's say that, again, I'm passing on wealth to the next generation, okay? And I want to avoid, say, probate laws, okay? So probate laws in the U.S., as an example, can tie things up a lot. So I say, okay, in order to avoid that, in order to avoid some of the uh, death taxes that come in in certain places, I decide to use a trust to pass my assets on. Okay, perfect, great. What do I do? I set up this trust and I say, okay, well, I have three kids. I want them each to get an even share. It's 33% each, right? Very simple. Well, that's one version, that's non-discretionary, right? The trustee doesn't have discretion in that example about who gets how much, right? Uh, and, and maybe I'm gonna say, hey, well, they're gonna get a certain amount when they turn 18. They're gonna get you know, a certain amount paid for their education. They're gonna, you know, you could specify in exhaustive detail if you wanted what will happen in that scenario, okay? The next side that you can look at is you can say, okay, well, I have a discretionary trust where I say, look, the trustee has the power to choose, okay? They're going to interpret my wishes and they're gonna say, okay, loosely speaking, what he wants to do is to provide for the next generations. He wants to make sure that they're Basic needs are cared for, they're not in hardship, and they're able to have their education and their health care paid for, but there's no specific amount. It could be for the kids, it could be for the grandkids, it could be for the great-grandkids. Well, then there's a lot of discretion there, right? Then the trustee has to make that decision. By the way, the trustee can change, right? You can have the trustee can be replaced, which brings us to the question of the protector, right? So what is a protector? A protector normally is the person, and you could set this up in many ways. This is part of why I'm saying, like, you could write out an exhaustive detail, and you should. You should have, like, a complex, well-thought-through trust where you can say, okay, perfect. I am going to uh, appoint a protector, so if the trustee ever abuses their powers, we can replace the trustee, okay? And you may have some restrictions on that. For example, they have to be, you know, say I'm setting up a Nevada Spendthrift uh, Trust, Asset Protection Trust, uh, maybe a self-settled spendthrift trust, right? Spelled self-settled uh, has some consequences of like what that means uh, basically is, you know, you might have, uh, you're settling it and you're the beneficiary. You know, you might have something like that, okay? Uh, or you're able to, to get something in that regard. Okay, so what happens is you could be in a situation where you say, all right, uh, I wanna have a protector in case the trustee is not doing a good job but if they replace the trustee, they must replace them with another trustee in Nevada. Why is this? Because I want Nevada law to prevail in the event that there's some sort of an attack. Okay, so that's an example. Another thing that a protector might do is they may deny distributions. So they may say, okay, all distributions can, a protector can prevent that from happening. Now, in some cases, the settler will have that power, right? That's, you could write it up that way or you could have it where the beneficiaries are potentially able to replace the uh, trustee. It just depends on you know, thinking through what are all the scenarios that this trust may experience, and it could last for you know, 100 years. Sometimes there's cases where can, there's no limit, and other cases there are limits. Sometimes there's taxes that occur after a certain number of years. For example, in Canada, you, know, you get to like about 20 years, all of a sudden they tax you on the growth in the assets. So that's a bit of an annoyance, right? You don't really want that. That's kind of a hassle. Imagine you have a house and the house has gone up a lot in value and now you have to sell the house in order to go on to the next level. So this is something about how it works. So this is why you would have a protector is to be able to replace the trustee. Uh, you want to pay attention to the discretionary nature of it, uh, to basically to the powers that people have, right? Because if, again, you have a case where you say, okay, I want to give powers to uh, the investment advisor to manage the investments because the trustee is not an expert at that. And so, you know, off we go. Uh, what would be another example? Well, we may say, good, we've got this case where the trustee has certain powers, the investment advisor has certain powers. Well, maybe the investment advisor doesn't want to be held legally responsible for some things, or the trustee 
doesn't want to say, hey, look, I'm willing to do this for you, but if this investment goes bad, I don't want to be able to be sued for that. So you're gonna write that sort of thing in the trust. There's lots and lots of permutations and variations that you can put in. But the important thing to note is that fundamentally a trust gives you a lot of flexibility, okay? It allows you to potentially get around a bunch of rules, which is one of the reasons that it's attractive. It allows you to extend things beyond your own lifetime, which is potentially very attractive. And it is probably the best protection tool if you're wanting to protect assets. So anyway, that's a, a broad overview. We're gonna go into more detail on specific subjects about trusts in the future, but uh, it should help you out. If you want some help with trusts, reach out to us. We're happy to give you some advice uh, where we can. If you need help being directed to appropriate trustees, et cetera, we can help you with that. And I will look forward to seeing you guys on the next video.